share your screen. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm Ted Bowman. I work at Acquia and the Drupal acceleration team. I'm working on auto updates right now, which is what I'm going to talk about. And my favorite at home ex work from home accessory is my dog, which is right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it just makes it funner to work at home. Um, I would say, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm really glad that my wife is here these days too. She's working from home. So that's nice too, but she's not an accessory. So <laughs> rude to call her an accessory. So I'll say my dog I actually had to bring some treats in to make sure that she would stay in the room. Uh, but there she is. Okay. So, uh, let me get to my slide deck, then I'll share the room or share my screen. Share screen. Okay. Can you see the presentation screen? Google slide thing. Uh yeah. Uh right. great. Um, okay. So yeah, so basically I said this. Um, so I just want to it so today I just want to give like a brief update of like where we are in the initiative. Um so right now, uh, there's a contrib version of the module, which started before I got involved with the project and that, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the contrib module started before I got involved. There's an 8.1x version, which is currently unsupported, but it was a uh, made for non-composer sites. Um, well, well, let's could, actually take, can yep. I pause here? Because yep. I think we have enough people that are new yep. um, that might want more context. Yeah, so, okay. Do you want to give context like what is Drupal and what are automatic updates? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And what is contrib? <laughs> okay. So Drupal is a content management system. Um, it's has a lot of basic functionality like um, account management, content creation, access control. Um, it's historically been really good for sort of a combination of um, people working on it with as developers and then people using um, in what we've called a site building role where they may or may not code, um, uh, but it could be a very technical position um, because working with Drupal in the UI can be very complex depending on the type, the actual Drupal site that you're working with. Um, and um, <clears throat> usually you would host this out either on a hosting system that is sort of made for Drupal or, or sort of made with Drupal in mind, um, whether, you know, it might be for hosting other stuff or you might host it out in a sort of generic, um, anything from like GoDaddy to um, your own server that you're running. Um, and generally uh, through, generally when you update from one version of Drupal to another, um, there's like a, a, a different levels of updates. There is the very basic sort of um, updates that might happen monthly. Um, and these are either bug fixes or security updates. And, um, and then every half of the year, we have something called a minor update, which might add more features. And then every couple of years or depending on the current Drupal cycle, um, maybe every few years, we have what's called a major update. And that um, is when a new version of Drupal comes out. Um, right now we're on Drupal 10, so the next major version would Drupal, be Drupal 9. And- um, Wait, you mean 11? 11. <laughs> Just checking if everybody's listening. <laughs> um, so it would be Drupal 11. And the order which I said those uh, updates, like the ones that happen sort of monthly patch releases and then happen twice a year, minor releases, then major are probably in the order of sort of um, difficulty or um, uh, risk probably. Yeah, what was, what was that? Risk? Yeah, risk to your site. Um, the ones that happen every month, every month it's, try, it's probably your site's going to be okay. The ones that happen um, every uh, half a year, 
probably your site be all, will be all right, but you really need to test stuff. And then the major updates, uh, you know, oftentimes it's it's in the, historically it's been a lot of work to get your site from say Drupal seven to Drupal eight or Drupal eight to Drupal nine. Um, things are getting easier, but um, but still it's it's a fair it's a fair amount of work. Um, and in this process of updating your site, no, nothing really happens without you doing some sort of action on the site. Um, it's not going to update itself. So the automatic updates initiative was the idea that there's a lot of things that make um, sort of owning a Drupal site or maintaining one expensive and time consuming. And one of the things is having to update your site periodically and keep up with updates. Um, so the automatic updates initiative is part of it is to try to address that and make it easier to maintain a Drupal site. And the other um, sort of reason for the initiative is for security purposes. Um, if a security update comes out for Drupal, which there's a particular security window, uh, a certain Wednesday of the month, I forget which one, um, where there could be a security update, you kind of have to be ready um, to apply that update, um, or depending on how bad the security fix or security problem that might um, be in the next, in your current, if there is a security release, you are encouraged to update to that security release as soon as possible so your site doesn't have an exploit that somebody could attack. Um, and historically, it's been very, um, a lot of sites have not done that up those those kind of updates or it takes them a while to do it um, not everybody has a drupal developer on staff um, and then if if they you know if you're an agency that has a lot of drupal sites it could take a lot of work to update all of your clients um, so that is sort of the reason for the initiative is to basically provide a um <clears throat> time uh, a way to at least automatically update for it. the the first goal is to automatically update for those sort of monthly releases um and the first thing that um we're targeting right now is drupal core meaning if you build a drupal site um you always will have drupal core and then most likely you're going to add on some contrib modules and themes so contrib is short for contributed meaning these are modules that you would get from Drupal, usually from Drupal.org um, that community members make and support. Um, sometimes they're uh, supported by an individual developer. Sometimes they're supported by a, a whole agency or company, um, depending on the, the type of module it is. Um, and so right now, the focus is not on those updates in particular, because those the modules and themes will also have their updates, their own updates, um, security or otherwise. Um, and the sort of goal after we get contrib updates is, or sorry, is Drupal core updates is to look at these contributed projects and see if we can also provide automatic updates for them. Um, there, uh, the, back to the slide here, there was a, previous version of this automatic updates module, uh, which is the 8x1x version, uh, that's currently unsupported because it was supported, it supported Drupal 8. I don't think it was ported to Drupal 9. Um, it was for non-composer-based sites, and Composer is a, a package manager. You could uh, think of it like as a software dependency manager. Basically, Drupal core is built on a bunch of other um, software libraries. Um, so when you update Drupal core, that sometimes will mean that you're updating those dependencies. Um, previously, Drupal did not operate operate like that. Um, so the first version of the automatic updates module didn't support sites that were um, using Composer. The second version, which I think we're at eight to seven now, actually, is a version that is Composer based, meaning that when it does the updates in the background, it's doing these composer operations. Um, so if you're familiar with Drupal, oftentimes you'll interact with the composer from the command line. Um, this has um, you know, many benefits of, of basically that we 
didn't write our own dependency management software, and we're using the one that's broadly used in the PHP community. Um, but it has been a pain point for a, a lot of people. Um, so part of the initiative also is to sort of address that, and at least on the updates that have more frequently, to have some developers have to not deal directly with Composer. Um, so the oh, let me see if I have my a demo of this of the site. Not, right let here. me just interject here. Um, the at, at least to my mind, right the. Um, and you know Ted's wearing actually wearing his Drupal security team hat. Mine is over in the closet. Um, but the there have been a few, but very bad, you know, Drupal security holes. Um, in particular, one in 2018 where uh, people sites were being automatically compromised within about six hours of the announcement of the vulnerability, um, and uh, it is. Uh, potentially hypothesized that that was one of the vulnerabilities that led to the leak of the Panama Papers, if people remember that um, interesting disclosure of massive amounts of, you know, information about uh, offshore bank accounts and whatnot. Uh, Peter, was this was this Drupal Gettin or Drupal Gettin 2? Uh, that was, yeah, the original one. Um, okay. The Panama so, Papers one was the original one. The other one, the other one, I, I still like it to be called Electric Hashaloo if you're going to have a code name. Um, uh was i mean the the time until there were known exploits was i think weeks so but you know the example of the first one where you know unless you were really really prepared um like typically you know we think people are doing okay if they update within you know a day or two or even a week sometimes but you know to ha have only a matter of hours before your site's um going to be hacked is is pretty rough and so the idea being that if there is something like that, and you had a system in place to automatically update Drupal, you know, obviously like many, many people's sites would not have been hacked. Um, the other thing I, I wanna interject because someone was putting something in the Slack about WordPress. Um, you, If you've you used WordPress, you might know that WordPress um, already does a version of automatically updating itself. Um, and, uh, Part of the reason that this has been a much bigger initiative for Drupal is that um, in order for a site to update itself, it actually has to be in some ways uh, hosted insecurely um, so that it can actually overwrite its own code. Um, so this feature that Ted is talking like, and there's a lot of, uh, the other part about it is that the WordPress updates uh, come without like a software signing mechanism. Um, so you don't actually have a ironclad assurance that the updates you're getting are actually the ones intended. And there was a point where someone had potentially compromised the WordPress update server. And if they had fully done that, could have pushed out malicious updates to, you know, most of the WordPress sites in the world, which is like 30% of the internet. So, um, so part of the goals here and why this has been difficult is, you know, we're kind of trying to say we're going to enable this to make it possible for people uh, who have have that sort of somewhat insecure site mechanism or have a workaround uh, so they can run this code without it being deployed insecurely. And also we want to implement code signing so that uh, malicious software that wasn't properly signed cannot be distributed uh, to the Drupal sites, even if potentially the server was compromised. Um, so those are, uh, that's some of the context, uh, why, why it's different than what WordPress is doing and, and uh, you know, actually more substantial technical challenge. So sorry, sorry to interject there, Ted. No, it's feel free as much. That's definitely good context. Um, yeah, I actually brought up a different slide deck that actually, since a lot of people are sort of maybe unfamiliar with, with Drupal or some people here to sort of give more context. Um, this is this is an example of a, like a composer command that I was saying where you actually would um, run something from the command line to start your project, um, to add new functionality to your project, and then also to update your um, update your site. Um, this is an example of what the form 
currently would look like it basically you would have um, a button and you update it and it and it takes you through a few steps to uh, to update your site. Um, and we're adding uh, right now unattended updates. So instead of having to sit there and press a button on a form, this would be something where um, where if you're not there, uh, Drupal would check every once in a while for one of these updates. And you can you can say, I want you know all supported updates or security updates only. Um, this is a person who's um, you know doesn't have to be active. That was the the point of the animation. Um, <laughs> Uh, or you can say only security updates, meaning like you'll take care of the other updates or you basically don't want your site updated until it needs to be updated for security purposes. Um, what I was talking about earlier, the patch, the sort of monthly updates is patch versions. We use this thing called semantic versioning. Um, so if you were on 9.3.10 going to 9.3.11 would be a patch version. These are uh, bug fixes. Um, they don't add new features to Drupal, and they're the least disruptive. Um, it could be a, a, a patch update, could be a security update. There's a security window once a month. Um, and when they push a security update, like say the one that um, Peter was talking about, the idea is not to put other functionality into that security update. So you don't release a new, like a security release of Drupal and say, oh, well, we've got all of this other functionality. Let's throw it in there with the security fix. The idea is just to push out the security update um, so that people can sort of be, um, I guess, more confident that they can update to this sec uh, new security release because they don't have to worry about what else might be in the release that might, you know, that might cause problems for their site. Um, and then a minor update, the middle number here, say in this case from 9.3 to 9.4, is scheduled six months. It could contain new features, um, and it's more disruptive. And then major is from a, like a 9 to 10 or from 10 to 11. Um, and this is really, you often have to update code. And right now, this is not in scope for the automatic updates roadmap, so we're not at least now thinking about, oh, let's figure out a way to automatically get somebody from nine to 10 or from 10 to 11. Um, they don't happen that often. So from a, a cost perspective, even if we could do it, you, it would still mean that the person would have to, you know, the site usually would have to update code, would have to figure out if all their modules are compatible. So um, it probably would be not helpful for us to try to do that automatically for you because it could often break break your site. Um, okay, so that is not true on the current testing. Um, so this is an example of a patch release, meaning it it goes from uh, nine nine three one to nine three twelve. Basically, um, updating a patch release would keep you anywhere in the same minor. So if you are on nine three or ten three, um, it would take you all the way up until 10, not not to 10, say in this case, not to 9.4, but anything in the 9.3 minor. Um, this is an example of like when they would come out, um, this is a past example, but if the 9.2 would come out in June, then 9.3 would come out in uh, 2000 in December, and then 9.4 would come out in the next June. Um, so we, we are adding actually minor support, but not in the unattended. So basically the idea that the patch support going from uh, say 9311, 9312, that could happen automatically in the background in the first version of the module went, that we hope to get in the core. But if you went from, um, a, I guess maybe I don't have a picture of that. If you went from 93 to 94, you would actually have to go to your site and press a button because really that's since they're a bit more disruptive we want people actually looking at their site and seeing if things are still as they expect after the update um so yeah what happens is basically you see the form you press the button to start it starts downloading the updates um and then it would say okay you're we're ready to update um it might give you messages here that it about information that it found during the update. And one thing uh, that Drupal has is something called database updates, where you would have to actually 
do an extra step after you updated the code to run these database or schema updates. And we would warn you about stuff like that here to say, okay, if you knew what that was, or you know, if you didn't, we would send you to link uh, to docs and you could decide, oh, is this a good time to be running these database updates or not? Um, so we can introspect stuff about, about the update at this point to give the user some more information of like, okay, is this a good time to do this particular update or not? Um, it's going to apply the updates and then it would reroute you to the page to show you, okay, your, your version of Drupal core is up to date. Um, basically what we do is we create a copy of your site, um, a copy of your code base, and then we apply the composer operation to update you to the next version. And then we put your site into maintenance mode and we then apply that update and take your site out of maintenance mode. So yeah, the idea is that um, your visitors can see the site except for the last sort of segment where we ap apply the code um, and the site would be temporarily taken offline and then brought back up after um, it is applied. And that basically um, the way we've implemented it, it's not safe to hit to basically um, use your Drupal site at the time that we're copying the files over um, because somebody might uh, access the site when it's sort of partially copied over. Um, so, but we're trying to keep that window of, of when we're copying over to a minimum. Uh, went over that. Okay, so that this is almost done. One, um, one thing that we've added for this um, actually at the behest of Peter was that originally we were going to do this. And if if you're familiar with Drupal, there's a module called automated cron um, that ships with Drupal. And we were going to use that functionality to perform the updates. Um, one problem with that is it is the web server itself updating Drupal's code, which means that um, the web server has to have permission to write uh, to write to the code base, which Oftentimes you don't want the most secure hosting setup. You wouldn't want the web server to be able to like rewrite its own code base. Um, one way to get around that is we've now have a drush command that you can set on what's called a cron tab. I think it's called a cron tab. Anyways, if you have some like hosting, we have cPanel or something like that, you can set up these um, jobs that will happen say every hour, every three hours. Um, so we've written a command that you can run from the terminal from a tool called Drush. And basically it will check for updates and then apply those updates as if um, um, without you having to visit the site. One of the main benefits of that is you can run that command as a different user. So you could have the web server um, the, the account on your web server that that on your server that runs say Apache or another web server not have permissions to rewrite your code base but the user that is going to run this trust command have the ability to rewrite your code base a more privileged privileged user um, so it does take another step to set up that command but a lot of um, even sort of lower price hosting has uh, a a control system called cPanel or something like it that lets you set up these cron tabs or these cron jobs. Um, so that's one of the sort of ways that we're trying to make it um, still be able to basically have your site be able to be updated, but also be in a more secure fashion. I don't know if, if Peter, you want to, anything more to say about that? Because that was something you were in, involved yeah, with. Yeah, I mean... That that's a little bit in the weeds, probably for most people. But I think I think yeah, there's enabling automatic updates like this, unattended automatic updates, you know, can have security considerations because again, it means there's an automated process that's updating your code. Um, so yeah. Um, so the other thing that Peter touched on is that like uh, signing. Um, signing of the packages to make sure that we know that the software that's being shipped down is the software that's supposed to be shipped down. Um, so we're using um, something called the update framework. 
Um, and that is a, um, it's, I think it was from the Linux cloud, the cloud foundation. Cloud native foundation now has it. Cloud native yeah. foundation. Basically it's a protocol. It's not a program in itself, but it's a, a system, a design system for how to update software um, securely. Um, it's been used by a lot of other software products. It's been used apparently by um, to update car operating systems. Um, so a lot of people have their eyes on it. Um, uh, we are Drupal, the Drupal Association is working on Drupal.org to pr basically provide the signing for the packages. And then the automatic updates module will will have a client version to basically check to make sure that what Drupal.org is providing has been signed correctly. Um, so this is basically one way to sort of fight attacks um, where people will try to um, basically try to give you a version of Drupal that is not secure. Either they would completely um, replace the code and give you some, give you code that they've written, or they will want to hide from you the fact that there are updates. Um, they're doing something called a freeze attack. So basically, if there is a security update, but your site doesn't know about it, um, then you know your site will be unsecure, insecure, and people can potentially attack it because they know that you haven't been updated to um, the latest version of Drupal. Um, okay. Um, so some of what we're working on currently is do, 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 update framework to whenever that. Uh, this is the the Drupal Association is working on basically now deploying the package signing. The tough is the update framework um, to Drupal.org. So that's a fair amount of work. Um, all the contributed projects in Drupal core itself. Um, there's a whole packaging system behind the scenes on Drupal.org that packages up every new release. And they're sort of laying on top of that a signing system so that when you request a new version, it uh, the client itself, your Drupal site can say, okay, is this actually from Drupal.org and is it is the latest version? Um, so that is, we can't get anything really into Drupal core until this is complete. Um, so that's currently why we're working in a contributed project. Um, this was the cron thing. So the other thing that we're working on now is the is the getting the unattended updates finished for the three dot x version of the site. And we are looking for alpha testers, basically. We're looking for people who want to test some future future functionality of the site, sort of sort of of the module, some sort of more experimental functionality. Um, so if you're if you're interested or if you know anybody's interested, um, what we want to test is we want to test not only um, Drupal core updates, but we also want to test update to contributed projects. So we want to test both these both these type of updates in the unintended manner, basically where Drupal will update itself. Um, and we're looking for, you know, there's a few things we're looking for, like initial, the main thing is these can't be mission critical sites um, because this is alpha functionality. Um, you know, you can't, you know, anything that's obviously like your whole business is running on, you're accepting credit cards, stuff like that is, is not the kind of sites we're looking for. You know, it could be like blogs or um, I don't know, just any anything you, that people have that that if it was down for a few hours would not be a huge deal. Um, we'd like to get real sites, meaning we're trying to get sites that weren't just made just for this testing this functionality, because obviously we can make test sites and, and test the updates on them. But um, oftentimes when you're dealing with sites that people didn't make for this particular purpose, then you might have conflicts that, that we wouldn't find if we were just making test sites ourselves. Um, and the other thing that we sort of need people, the testers to have is to for to have periodic backups. So backups of your code and your database, because this is alpha functionality and it could break, obviously it could, it could mess up your site. 
um, if something we did goes wrong. Um, uh, so that's why if you have backups, then you can restore to that and it's not you know the end of the world if, if something goes wrong. Um, and the well, other well, thing- Presumably you want to backup so you could recreate the problem. Yeah. Well, hopefully you would have backups before the- Right. Well, I mean, but you you want to have the version of the site and then they ran the automatic update and it broke and you as the developer would presumably want to be able to reproduce that from their backups if you could. Understand yeah. What the was. I mean, that's, that's one of the reason for the backups. The other reason is we don't want people testing this and being like, oh, you totally broke my site and now my site's gone. Um, we yeah. want you to be able to be in a position where, oh, you know, you helped us to test out, but you're not completely broken. You know, you can get back to where you were. But yes, the backups would be good also for us testing it to see to see what happened. Um, sort of in exchange for this, if people are testing, we would help you set up um, the automatic update system on your hosting. I mean, obviously, this has a side benefit to us to figure out, okay, you know, what are the pain points for people setting this up? What kind of hosting does it work well on? What does it not work well on? Um, but yeah, we would, uh, I mean, potentially you could just set it up and it works fine. And um, we have documentation on the module um, that would help you with certain pain points. But if that doesn't work, um, we would be here to, you know, sort of, sort of guide you through the process and figure out and figuring out what the problem is, where is our documentation lacking for, you know, like if you hit a roadblock um, trying to install it and it just wasn't obvious from our documentation, like how you get past that roadblock, you know, we would help you get past that roadblock. And as, you know, as a side benefit to us, we would hopefully update our documentation to say, okay, the next person that hits a similar problem, we can, you know, get them. <clears throat> the next person hopefully would not need us to sort of help them along the way to to get the system set up because our documentation would be improved um so yeah if you know of anybody where there's an issue that i'll put in the uh, zoom chat when i'm done so you can pass it on to people um we're asking people to basically like comment on this issue um and you know sort of read what read the further description that's on the issue and then comment there and we're sort of we'll monitor to see uh to get back with people um but yeah i mean that's sort of where we're at um we would have liked to have been um in core by now but um i think things on our side and things on the drupal association side have been taking longer than um we had hoped for and um but you know it's something that we haven't in the drupal community haven't made before so it's sort of always thinking of edge cases of uh, potential problems and we you know we'd like to think of those problems now rather than when a security update comes out and you know thousands of sites and once it's in core thousands of sites hopefully will be relying on it to um to deploy those security updates so we'd rather figure out the major problems now but we do at some point need people to actually start testing this. We have like 190 sites running this now. Um, we don't know how many people have turned on the unattended update feature. And I mean, we don't really know how many of those people just installed it and never used it. Um, but presumably some people have, are using it. We don't get that many bug reports. So I'm hoping that's a good sign. Um, we've gotten a few bug reports, but but not many. Um, so. It's either, you know, people install it and then aren't using it or people are installing it and it works well. So we're trying to, with the testers, get an idea of, of what the case is. If, if it's just working well for most people or if most people just turn it on, have some problem with the configuration and then just sort of stop. We're hoping that's not the case. We're hoping if, if that was the case, people would be complaining more, which they're not, um, which I guess hopefully is a good sign. Um, so question on point four, you said it's actually a custom Drush command, right? Not Drush cron, or can you? It is a custom one that just does the updates. Right. Yeah. And. Oh, that's, yeah, this is old. I need to update yeah. this. Uh, but I guess I did have a question, which is, um, I think that's a, 
really important to have is there in the future it seems like you probably also for kind of the lowest end or least you know complicated consumers of this uh probably want something that just actually uh does run with the um whatever poor man's cron or the drug yeah cron. yeah that part as out. an alternative or that runs off that's already working the drush was an add-on for like extra security so you could so if you want to use that you have to turn you turn off running on cron and require um, since we added the drush when we haven't actually updated the uis there haven't been a release with the drush one yet so we haven't okay. updated but the idea would be you would tell us i want to run you know in the background it's actually not using automated cron it's using a custom thing for a number of reasons automated cron doesn't won't work super well for this case for timeout reasons okay. but um but it runs like uh, automated cron does Sure. Um, but yeah, we would have a UI. The next thing we need to do is is to make the form setting to say, okay, I've chosen to do this via the Drush command. Don't run this in the background for me. Sure. Um, and there's not much we can do to tell that you've actually set up the Drush command, but we'll have like a validator that would say like, hey, you've said you're going to rush in this Drush command periodically, but we haven't had, you know, it hasn't run in a few days or something like that. We'll be able to tell the last time it runs so sure. in that case we'll be able to see like okay it's actually running or we'll be able to see you know you said you're gonna you know you've said don't do the background updates i'm gonna run the drush command and then the site detects that the drush command's never been run so we could at least flag that for you right um, this could be you forgot or could be you set it up but it's not actually running periodically like you thought it was um so i think a lot of that is gonna have to be like documentation for how you how you set that up fair uh, yeah um and i'm trying to remember so you said this is composer based and you you showed that example um when it runs an update it updates it creates a new version of the composer lock file is that yeah what happens yeah it runs a composer require for the exact version of Drupal. Um, and it does that in a staged environment. And then if everything's okay, it copies the files back over in a non, like in a just sort of dumb copying way. Sure. Um, but it does check to see that your composer lock has not changed in your active site in the meantime, meaning like you haven't been, you haven't staged an update and then also run composer operations on your active site. Sure. Yep. And I guess that means you have to depend on them having a loose version constraint for Drupal core also in, in their composer. Oh, and no, the because question. We'd, we'd be requiring a different version. We'd be updating that. Oh, so you do a require. So you're updating yeah. the composer and the composer lock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kathy, you had a question? Yeah. Uh Going back to what you were kind of talking about, like whether you can tell if people are using the automatic updater mm -hmm. is, uh, could you could you talk about that a little bit more? I would be really interested. Like, what what are the ways that we could possibly tell? And you mean if we could tell, like, the people who said that if they've downloaded the the module to see if they're actually using it well kind of like usage statistics for like contrib modules on drupal.org yeah but, but not installed the automatic not installed the module but i'm wondering like if there's logs or we could tell from the logs of like how the downloads are going out of drupal.org like if they're getting signed are they is everything going to get signed or so is everything will get signed eventually so we're the contrib the the mod the version of this module that's not in core is not re is not um dependent on that signing infrastructure and part of it's just so that we can get a version testing before that signing is done uh -huh, yeah. we're, gonna, we're gonna require https um requests basically to ask for your, all the composer requests have to be https um but um so you're kind of as secure as you would be as if you're running composer 
from the command line. Sure. So, but once we have the package signing in there, we still won't really be able to tell how many people are using the module because the package signing will be um, uh, done for everybody. Yeah, I guess actually we will be able to tell some stuff in the sense that as soon as the module comes out and starts using the package signing, nobody else will be using it. Anybody. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, like the first people. Yeah, anybody else could be. They just have to install a, um, a particular composer plugin that we're going to require. Anybody else could say, oh, I also want to use that composer plugin. So you're packages could be signed you, you know we'd, you'd have that extra protection even if you're, you're using composer from the command line but probably most people won't go out and get that plugin so right. if, um we could ask the drupal association to see like okay do you have a um can you keep some sort of log if people are asking for this packaging information yeah but that but right now we can't do that because nobody's out because not it doesn't exist yet right it doesn't exist and yeah uh -huh. yeah but that is an interesting idea to like see if they could keep logs of how many things people are requesting these particular signing files yeah. or maybe the module could put a header in the request and then they could keep track of it like some special well, i don't know well there is a uh so, I mean, Drupal or the way it keeps track of how many sites are using particular modules. Do you know? Do you know how that works, Kathy? Oh, it's like, it's like, it's only modules that are reporting. But I don't. But yeah. I, so I, what I know about that is like the numbers are not real accurate. But I don't know technically how it's done. So, I mean, it's sort of it's similar, right? Because that's sites with a current update module that just warns you that updates are available. Um, when a site makes that request, it generates uh, not random token, but random-ish token, maybe based on the URL of the site or something, uh, but something you can't, it's a hash, you know, cryptographic hash, you can't reconstruct the original string. Um, and so that way, and that is sent along with the request and the, you know, we could probably do almost the same um, oh. when sites request, yeah, the metadata. So we could just say like how many distinct sites are requesting the metadata. Um, I don't, Ted, I don't know if that's been part of the discussion already, but you know, that's probably worth um, thinking about. No, it hasn't been, but yeah, that is something that um, we could look. I mean, potentially we could use the same mechanism because we actually rely on the update module. Yeah. Um, though composer itself is doing all the requests for the signing stuff that's not a drupal part but we could somehow get the token. that's a flag yeah get the token to composer somehow probably yeah well is it so the drupal but how does the drupal site know that there's a pending update right it must download the, it doesn't download the signing data um it uses the regular xml to figure out if there is one okay um, but then also it would then ask the signing system like for the most recent, what they call targets. So we should talk about that then, Ted, because that's actually problematic. Because mm -hmm. um, I would really think that the, the update sh should be detected and triggered based on the actual tough data, which is signed, right? Well, I think the idea was to you could sign the XML also. Yeah, you could, but Tuff has its own mechanism for this already, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have to I'll have to look at that. I mean, we are like it is kicked off from the fact of, about the X from the XML, but yeah, right. if you had a freeze attack, you would. Um, against that then potentially you wouldn't know about a new update right yeah. yeah i think that would that would be yeah the concern and i know at some point they were supposed to rewrite that and make it json instead of xml or something um but uh, clearly that's down on the party list yeah. Um, yeah so you know again like maybe moving that entire thing to read the the tough 
data instead of that other data for available updates would yeah um because even even if like sites didn't turn on the automatic updates and didn't even use the signing you know, validate the signature i mean they'd still at least have the same data yeah yeah we'll probably have to do that okay so make an issue. sorry ted i'm just making more work oh, no it's uh something we were going to have to do yeah but for i mean until that infrastructure is deployed then i mean the automatic or any of the updates are are kind of have so the sort of same security problems that any composer operation would have it's still possible to um yeah it's not a composer is not a perfect system for providing um uh letting the system know which updates are available so right i mean we could either not deploy i mean i think if once relying on on tough then we need to rely on it for everything but i'm hoping we don't have to rely on i'm hoping at least in contrib we don't have to wait for tough knowing yeah. that that's an imperfect system right well yeah and i understand yeah you're in a little position here of like wanting to try to get testers yeah before the the entire uh contraption is built yeah. <laughs> um we'll see yep yeah um so yeah maybe uh at this point we could also yeah see if anyone has general like background or context questions because i realize like some of this is pretty in in depth though so, ted i appreciate you uh, stepping back and giving more context um yeah. uh and also or drupal questions or um or you know we can also people can ask ted some more hard questions about uh uh Web application security and see if he can uh, live up to his hat. Yeah, I would take this hat off, but I'm not sure what my hair looks like under it. <laughs> uh -huh. I could do this though. Um, uh, we do have a question, yeah, in the chat about Drush Cron, and so, um, I, I don't know what other applications you as an equivalent. Um. But the idea, a cron, in the broad sense, like a cron task on like a Linux or Unix operating system, right, is just any uh, command that's run on a periodic basis, right? You have a, a list of them and what schedule they're supposed to run on. Um, and Drupal kind of adopted that term um, for uh, the notion that there are certain operations that should be you would probably want to trigger on a recurring basis um but not necessarily you know there's not things that you want to happen in every um web request um so an example of something that might happen uh there would be like you have new content and you're adding the search content to the search index for the site and um so the processing for that might take a while uh, you don't necessarily want to delay someone's viewing the web page for that processing to happen. So instead, you have a separate uh, system for making that happen on a regular basis. And uh, you can do it through a web request to a specific endpoint on the site, or you can do it uh, through a script. And Drush Cron is basically, so Drush is sort of a general purpose tool that has many commands. And the Cron command essentially executes from the PHP command line uh, interface uh, this code as opposed to you doing a web request. Um, and the advantage of that is that the command line code generally uh, is much more uh, liberal in terms of memory constraints and timeouts uh, than a web request. Um, and particular timeouts may not have any limit. So you can do a lot of processing, you know, there, you know, and you invoke it every five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, depending on your preference, um, typically. And um have those things handled um so that's that's kind of drush cron is a specific tool for doing this and then the you know, drupal cron is kind of the broad broad term for um though that code that gets uh executed on when when that periodic process is triggered and we had thought about using the basically the cron system or drush cron to for the updates, but one problem with that is after we apply the updates, we want to be um, 
very careful that nothing runs after us in, in the process and the request because um, your code has just been updated. So um, it kind of is in an indeterminate state um, where uh, PHP may not have fully reloaded all the classes. So we made our own process so that we can make sure that we're the first and the last thing that runs in that process. Um, to, to be safe, safer for timeouts and memory constraints, but also safer that anything running after us doesn't have any side effects. Yeah. And then, yeah, the this one of the security aspects that, you know, the Ted mentioned and I'll highlight again, and, you know, sort of a problematic aspect of WordPress's, you know, self-updates, right, is that the fact that WordPress can self-update means that the PHP running in the web server can write its own code, uh, which means any flaw in the code of the website could thereby be used to change other code in the website. Um, and, you know, so that's kind of a recipe uh, for the sort of, you know, hack that could uh, be used to, you know, attack many um, different sites. Um, so the, the idea, uh, of having like a separate command to run this unattended automatic update is people know about, um, you know, setting up multiple user accounts on your server. You can have a user account that uh, runs the web server and runs PHP for the web server um, and a different user account um, where you run that uh, particular command on a periodic basis. And that other user account could be the one that has permission to write the code um, whereas the user account running the web server and running PHP would not have permission to change the code of the site. Um, and that way you reduce the, the scope of risk that, a you know, some problem in the website code could be, then be used to, uh, you know, further change and exploit the site. So that's the, the reason, yeah, I kind of was pushing Ted in, in uh, at least to support that that is an option. Um, and, and, you know, of course, there's also web hosts that deploy the code in a way that it uh, can never write itself or, you know, you don't have access to this facility. Um, so the other bit of this, and Ted, I don't know if you didn't really touch on this is, but maybe alluded to it is that th this might be a way just to make it easier for people to uh, do updates to their site, let's say locally, and then add them to get or another version control system um, and deploy them. Um, and do you, do you have anything? Um, yeah. You could so, add about that. Yeah. So basically, I mean, one of the side effects of this initiative is that we're building a tool for running composer operations. So um, if you say did have a system where you had version control, then you have a, um, a CI system to, uh, continuous integration to push changes from your local or from a development environment into production. Um, um, probably the unattended part that's running on production, updating your site will, will likely not work for you. But if you wanted to use this system to just um, to use our forms to say, okay, show me the updates that are happening, and then I will run them locally through the form. And then however you were getting your changes before, up to your server, you, you would sort of do the same that you had done before. Um, as a side effect of that, um, there's an initiative in, uh, called the Project Browser Initiative, which is basically um, building a tool for you inside Drupal to discover new functionality, new modules um, that you could then install through the browser, which um, there used to be a sort of simple way to install stuff through a browser in Drupal a, a long time ago, but that way um, doesn't work well with com the composer uh, dependency manager system I was talking about earlier. So the project browser would allow people to do that through the browser. And then the thing that we built called package manager that deals with the composer would actually do the installing. So that's also something you, you might want to like run locally through your browser and, and you know update modules, install new modules, and then deploy that to the server, either through version control or, or um, up to a dev server first and then to production. 
um, in cases where um, your hosting environment is not writable at all. So you could never um, potentially even run the drush command to update your site. The code base would just not be writable at all. You could do it either locally on your computer or another environment. Um, like oftentimes now people are using cloud IDEs that are um, attached to a, a temporary server that is writable. And you could run these tools through the browser there um, where your system is writable. But so hopefully, you know, it could become a productivity tool as well as a kind of security tool for people that don't like to be on the command line. Yeah. And I think eventually, once we have this system, it may, we may be able to do um, more helpful things with building a the Composer UI. Right now, you know, we're not sort of like trying to figure out Composer problems and compatibility and stuff like that, but um, or try to figure out, you know, which version of this help you figure out which version of module X goes with module Y or whatever. But potentially, it's something we could do in the future. Now that there, you know, there's a an API that you can build uh, user interfaces on top of. Right. Okay, well, this has uh, been a great update, Ted. Um, Thanks for the time. Appreciate that. Um, and let's, yeah, maybe now we'll open up to general questions. Certainly welcome people to continue asking questions about this, uh, but if you have questions, more general web development questions. Um, oh, and I... Here, Ted, I got I got to head out to sort of match you. Alrighty. <laughs> um, so, not uh, to ruin the Drupal security team's reputation. I'm a a uh, what do you call it? provisional member and and uh, Peter's a yeah okay a real one. So yeah, don't anything I said. Don't let it reflect on the Drupal security system. Security. Yeah. Team. Kathy, do you have a hat? <laughs> uh, I do. I do have a hat. Let me see how quickly I can get it. <laughs> but um, okay, I know I'm trying to remember at the beginning. Someone was was interested in science project. I heard a couple of new people that were new, relatively new to web development. Um, and yeah, wondering if people have any other uh things looking for help on debugging or want feedback on. Those are all uh great things for this kind of open Q and A section. Um, so please. Uh, you know, you should be able to unmute yourself and just talk. Um, if uh, if you have trouble unmuting, you know, let me know. Hey everyone, like so, as like I mentioned before, like we developed a product called Keyspreader. It's a you know site sites for Drupal or WordPress or any CMS. So we're looking for some uh, paid data in for the Drupal and also for WordPress CMS. Uh, so if anyone is interested, like you can, you know, uh, just DM me so that I can share more details on that. And once the beta register will help, will, will be provided more uh, if they like to implement the case spreader there for their website or for the client website, the discounts or something like that will be provided for in the pricing level. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the page you linked. Uh, so is this, are you actually utilizing the uh, native content structure of the data from the site or you're actually crawling it as a, like a web crawler? Yeah, crawling it as a web crawler. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, analogous to maybe the discontinued like Google site search, um, essentially? Exactly, yeah. We are obviously they're replacing the Google site search with more customization and, you know, uh, you cannot pretty much control anything in the Google site search. Uh, in Keyspider, you can control everything with uh, you know customization and uh, control everything, like mm -hmm. synonyms and result ranking. Like uh, for particular keywords, you can rank the results, and you can promote cross promote with some other campaign. 
mm -hmm. based on the keywords the user searching in your website or you know someone searching like snaps is nothing like someone searching like coronavirus the covid 19 results should come in the results right so even the, even though it's not found in the keyword it should come in the result this mm -hmm. kind of functionality and uh, so if someone searching like you are uh, your content will pro like your website will have a uh, 10k document and uh, the same keyword will match in at least a uh, uh, 1k document so how you will uh, you know which link will come first and second and third in the search result that kind of you know customization can be happen in case by that and it, there are more more thing like again uh, tell one by one so yeah uh, you can visit our website and you can you know uh, in the in the product page you can understand better about the case by but so as like mentioned like beta test will be uh, really helpful for us okay all right well good to know about um well it's got a it's got a 1.0 release yeah okay good uh doesn't have a little shield. Do you guys need to get opted into the uh, security advisory policy? Yeah. Security, advi security advisory coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any any feedback would be great to you know improve our product. Well, yeah. Well, that's the first feedback, right? You yeah. Don't... I'll wear my hat to pass that on. Okay. <laughs> From the security team, we'll help you. Like, if there's any trouble, you know, like if the form is confusing or you're not sure what to do. You can reach out and and uh, and somebody will totally help you figure out how to how to get the the approval. So sure. on, yeah. if you look at your module page, right, it says there's a warning that says this project is not covered by security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We seen that. Like we we our team is have a plan to work on that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's the first feedback. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so some of us won't, you know prefer not to use any modules that don't have that coverage. And yeah, I mean, it looks like this is a pretty new, new project here. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. We thought actually we thought module and we provide the search API, uh, which you can use yourself in your code and customize the search page. Yeah. And then. This is so cool. Thanks for like coming and yeah. sharing your module. It's like a personal introduction. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then anyone else have things they want to talk about or fun problems they've solved recently? You must have solved some, some fun problems recently, Kathy. Oh, I did, but it was a Drupal one and we've kind of been talking a lot about Drupal. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to somebody has a question uh, like that they were working on today, I would encourage anybody to unmute and be like, okay, so I was working on this project this weekend and I got this error. What does this error mean? Like we can totally troubleshoot. Otherwise, we're going to end up talking about Drupal some more. <laughs> Which is also fine. <laughs> All right. Well, while people think of something, I I do I do have something. Let me pull it up. Um, oh yeah, it was. I'm looking for the Drupal.org issue. Could have been this one. Yes, okay, I found it. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, let's do portion of my screen. I'm not plugged into my external monitor. Uh, that's one of the things 
uh, I like about an external monitor is you can just share a whole monitor and then you don't have to worry about like revealing stuff that's on your computer. Okay, this should be uh, good enough. Uh, can you see uh, a Drupal.org issue page? Yeah. Great. Uh, so I'm um, I'm on a project. Uh, I don't think this is a secret. Um, where uh, we're helping the Iowa government uh, migrate um, some sites to Drupal. And uh, the project is going really super well. And we're all up to date with our modules. We've been using um, an automatic updater called Renovate Bot, uh, which is like an external to Drupal solution kind of in that same problem space Ted was talking about with the Drupal module automatic updater. Well, we've been using Renovate Bot and it's keeping us very up to date, uh, but we're still on uh, Drupal 9.5. We're not on Drupal 10 yet, but we're running uh, a uh, really up-to-date version of PHP. So we're PHP, I think 8.1, right on track, no problem. Uh, but uh, so we were looking at doing the PHP 8.2 update, uh, but we're not quite ready to do the Drupal 10. And we started working on it and we're like, can we do this or can't we? Can you, can you have Drupal 9? running on PHP 8.2 because it seems like you can, but it also seems like you can't. And so there's a little interesting story I could tell about how I investigated that question and what what I think the answer to that is. Uh, so here I go. Um, Okay, so I, I Googled and I ended up on a Drupal.org issue page uh, about lambdas because we were getting a, a composer uh, require. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Wink. Oh, I'm trying it. Hold on. Where did it go? Don't know. Just a second. I think it was the last tab. Yeah. No right. Yeah, let me just pull that out and get rid of this other one. Okay, great. Uh, so, so we were getting a composer like conflict when we were trying to upgrade to PHP 8.2. They were like, uh, this lambdas, lambdas. And I found this issue and I was like, oh yeah, this totally sounds like what we're doing. Uh, and I got down here and they were like, uh, going through, they uh, like found the solution, and uh, I I think it might have been Effulgencia who was like, okay, we're gonna split this into another issue. So they took part of the solution that they had and uh, changed, narrowed, keep kept the scope real narrow, made a different issue, fixed the problem, and now they're coming back here to discuss like so a little bit of policy or kind of like some finer details. Uh, and uh, yeah, and as part of uh, this other issue, um, this person who I don't know uh, how to say their name, S. Musgrave, Musgrave, uh, asked this really smart question here uh, that. Uh, they were like, hey, Effulgencia, okay, this makes sense, but what does this mean? 
what does this mean? Do we need to update the docs to say that you can run Drupal 9.5 on 8.2 or what? Like, can we now? Uh, and so uh, people kind of ignore the question for a while. They are very into the technical details. Technical details, da 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 da. da. And then it, happily at the end, though, uh, Catch comes back around and comes back to ask Musgrave's question. And it's just like, what a great question. Uh, and, and the best, this is the conclusive answer that I have is uh, no, no, you, we should not be running Drupal 9.5 on PHP 8.2 just yet. And, and how will we know when, when we really should? Well, either we'll see in this issue. Uh, let's see if I'm logged in or not. Am I? Oh, I, I think I might be. Uh, and I'm already following it. Uh, so I would get a notification here, uh, but really it's, it'd be on the, uh, the docs page. Uh, it would just be like Drupal. 9.5 PHP. I think it's this one. Does it say? Where does it say? I actually don't know. It says it somewhere in your search results. It also says that Drupal 9.5 is the last release, so it may not change. See right there, it says Drupal 9.5 is suspended. You do not have full support for PHP 8.2. Yeah. Somewhere on the page, it says it. <laughs> PHP requirements. Yeah. See, PHP requirements. Right now, it says 8.2 is only Drupal 10. So whatever Catch is worried about, I think it might be like something about automated tests coverage or like uh, deprecating. Yeah, it, it, it says it doesn't have automated test coverage for PHP 8.2 on Drupal 9.5. So yeah, so it's kind of like, I bet you you could. I bet you could run your Drupal 9.5 site on 8.2 and not run into any issues, but mm, you might. <laughs> like, like, you know. So I think it'll it'll be maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, and then I, you know, if I were risking to predict the future, I think I think we're gonna see this docs page get updated without really that many changes going into Drupal. I don't know though. That's pure speculation. Ta-da. That's that's all I got. Hmm. So are you going to Drupal 10 in your pro project? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shortly. Like we're going to start getting on it like probably in a few weeks or like maybe within the two months for sure. Yeah. We don't want to wait too long. Sure. Uh, but we don't want to do it too early either. We want to let some other people run into the troubles first and fix those and then uh, get a little benefit from the community fixing bugs. Sure. Um, so Ted, you mentioned something about this, something that looks like a video game thing for kids. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's I definitely are, not Drupal. It's <laughs> definitely not Drupal. I could share my screen and show if people are interested. Sure. Um, yeah, basically I have been helping a friend's, um, eighth grade kid do like a eighth grade project and they're at a school where basically they get a eighth grade project and they can do anything they want and they can kind of like report anything they want so um he was interested in learning to code and he knew i coded or his dad knew i coded or mom um so we've been meeting once a week for this since january or maybe before and so i started with um code.org um game lab which is um actually maybe we started before this before game lab but game lab is sort of a way to let me see a sample project 
Oh, I can't redo it. Let me see if I can look at a view, a gallery of one existing. So Game Lab is basically, um, I guess, no, oh, where did it do code? Um, it has this system here of a sort of simplified JavaScript. And over on the left, you can run it. And I just picked that one who happened to have sound. Anyways, it's very hard. It's it's it does guide you through all of the making of the code, which is really nice. But then when you actually get to make a game, it becomes very complex because it doesn't have a lot of the stuff you would need for games. Um, but it has the site itself has a lot of learning resources for sort of just going through um, basic um, stuff like if statements, logic, um, very basics of programming. But we got past that and we wanted to actually make a game. So we, I basically looked up what uh, the game lab on this code.org uses behind the screen because I was trying to figure out, okay, if I wanted to get this kid off of the in browser thing, and on to making a game directly, what is the engine that the sort of gaming or the JavaScript libraries they use so he doesn't have to relearn everything? And so what uh, I found was it's this thing called uh, P5 Play, and it's a JavaScript library that has a lot of physics engine stuff. And so I found some of their examples on open processing. And so open processing has the code on the right and then uh, the game on the left, you can, you can see the game working and you can really just quickly change things. Like if I change the gravity to negative 10 in this world and reloaded it, uh, the person instead of going down would fly into the sky. Um, so a lot of like really simple stuff. And so code.org, when you start to make games, you have to do a lot more low level stuff than I would like this kid to have to do as far as like, um, I don't know, as far as like his enjoyment of being able to make something really fun without having to do a lot of stuff. So uh, play.org, uh, P5 Play has a lot of um, sort of built-in stuff like gravity and collision detection. It's been really nice. And the site they built to learn it is also really nice um, because it sort of breaks up um, the concepts and you can go to any particular page. Let me see. Um, let me look at physics. They have physics down here somewhere. Um, it has little code examples that you can use where it talks about this one. This one talks about physics. And then um, it gives a little code example. And then I think basically how it works, I'm just sort of discovering it, is each one of these examples exchange changes like one property. So this one is given the example of the, if this thing on the bottom has a slope and you can sort of refresh and you see that the ball goes off to the side and you can see, okay, if I did the, if I change this to have more of an angle, then the floor is more of an angle and the ball rolls off quickly. And the kid was like, oh, what happens if you, um, you know, have a 90 degree thing and it just sits there on the top because it's perfect. <laughs> then if you put 91 and you reload it, then it looks like it's going to stay, but then it falls off because it's not perfectly there. So I'm hoping this will be, he's enjoyed code.org, but then when we actually went to try to make a game, it, it looked like it was going to be pretty difficult. Um, he's on a Chromebook. So also like trying to get something local for him to develop looked like it was going to be difficult. Um, so I think open processing is going to be good for that. Um, I might suggest to his parents that they buy like the monthly subscription to get a history of his code. Um, we're open processing. I think um, if you don't, um, if you don't pay like your old, your history goes away after seven days, which might be, might be fine. Um, the other thing I really um, thought was interesting was this sort of tile mechanism where you set up these different types of tiles. Um, it has grass, water, and coins, and then you make this sort of like just key, you key in what you want the world to look like. Um, and then it shows up here. So if we see this like coins and grass up, up at the top here, I can just remove these two um, things. And then if I reload, these two should go away. Um, so it's, 
I don't know, with working with Drupal all day, it's nice to see sort of immediate results of things that maybe aren't so important, but also are maybe kind of fun. So yeah, if you're looking, I mean, if you're looking yourself or interested in programming, I think code.org is a good way. But if you know of kids, especially it's geared towards kids. Um, and then uh, P5 Play is, is what they use behind the scenes and you can use it directly, um, which is pretty nice. So what is openprocessing.org? Uh, it's kind of like code pen or JS fiddle or something like that, where you basically can just do these, um, simple projects. Let me see if, I think it's just a way to sort of share code. Actually, I'll see what this person, person who did P5 play. Um, if I look at their user account, I can see their different projects and I click on this one. Um, it'll load up the, I think the, what it looks like to the user at first. And then if you click code, it'll show you the code. And then it will sort of show them next to each other and you can edit the code, refresh and see how it changes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll load up different, I think sort of limited libraries, but maybe some libraries you can uh, paste your URL for a JavaScript. I don't know if they have certain built-in libraries that they support, um, but then other ones I think you can upload. Hmm. You can upload files for your um, images and stuff like that and uh, sounds. So it's been fun. I've only been doing this part. I've been using code.org for a few years with different kids, but uh, I've just now been using open processing. I think uh, I think it'll be good. Yeah, looks like a fun thing, especially for these little, yeah, um, animation examples. And that's yeah, like very powerful. Yeah. Um, and they have like a, the other thing that this person did was like an asteroids clone. Where is it? It is just interesting to see that you could, you know, the amount of code it takes to do it. It's like playable. Uh, I thought it was playable. I thought, I can't remember how you do the buttons. Anyways, yeah, there you go. Hmm. But then you can open it up and be like, oh, that's not a lot of code considering, you know. Right. Yeah. So it's fun. Cool. <laughs> you know, it's good if you actually spend time playing them, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. That would that was a fun diversion um, and also web development. <laughs> I feel I feel like now I need to like embed. We need to start embedding some like JavaScript games like into into uh, our our, our SciShield site. Good read. Like if you if your lab is safe, you get to you get to score more points. I don't know. <laughs> Um, anyone else have a question they want to raise or something they want to show before, before we wrap up? Well, if not, um, almost nine. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. We will, yeah, continue to do these, uh, monthly. Um, before the pandemic, we did them in person. Uh, that's, I think, not yet on the table um, for us. And it's nice then to be able to have people like Ted drop in from remote and uh, share their uh, knowledge with us. Um, but yeah, appreciate everyone coming. And yeah, uh, if you want to really get into Drupal hardcore, yeah, take a look at that, that upcoming event in Montreal, which is closer than you think to New Jersey. and. Uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, which is actually probably about as far away as Montreal is, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, uh, otherwise, uh, we do uh, hang out on Slack. You can go to drupal.org slash Slack, um, and that gives you information about uh, how to join. And there's a New Jersey channel uh, where people, mostly from New Jersey, but also our friends and associates from all over the place, uh, hang out and, uh, you know, you feel free to ask more questions there um, or just, you know, uh, say hi. So great to see everyone. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.